immediately, but I want to first take the opportunity to thank two of our before Maura leaves, and as Lisa is in the room too, I don't know if she is, but um, this, uh, this uh, fifth annual conference is not only organized by the three different uh, agencies here, MPI Clinic in Georgetown, but it's people behind it, and I just want to thank my colleagues, Doris Meisner and Don Kerwin, uh, in, in doing this, but also the very hard work that um, uh, Lisa and Mara have done to make this happen. So let's give them a round of applause. And thank you all for staying for this uh, final plenary um, before any of the breakout sessions. And this one really is the, the wrap-up session, uh, again, looking ahead to what the next administration is going to inherit and trying to think through now that the Department of Homeland Security has been in place for five years, what has worked well, what needs to be worked on, f on, on further to really do some sort of assessment uh, at this point and, uh, you know, for some advice for the next administration. And for that, we have three experts I'm very pleased to, to say today, um, from, two from governmental offices and one from the uh, practitioner and NGO community. I'll introduce them briefly now, and then they'll, they'll speak for about 10 minutes each in order. And we will definitely have some time for Q&A. So please, um, let's have an active Q&A session as well and show the energy you have at the end of the day. I know it's been a long day. Okay, first we have uh, the, the uh, Assistant Secretary for Policy at the Department of Homeland Security. I'm pleased that we have Stuart Baker with us today. He was appointed by President Bush to that position in 2005. Stuart has held several gov senior government positions as general counsel in a couple of instances. He is a partner, has been a partner, at a major law firm here in town. And, and, and his, he has a long career as, a, uh, as an esteemed lawyer, um, having clerked a, a good number of years ago for Justice Stevens. Um, so we're delighted to have Stuart with us today. We also have Lisa Powell, who is the, sitting next to Stuart, uh, who is the Chief Investigative Counsel of the Senate Subcommittee on Oversight of Government Management. That is part of the... Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. I believe this is the first of, in our five years that we've had uh, somebody from the Hill on, from that committee, and I'm delighted that we do. We don't talk enough, I don't think, about the government, over the, the congressional <coughs> oversight role um, that is played. So uh, we're delighted to have Lisa here. She practiced law with a union side law firm here in town before going to the Hill. She also practiced with Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, where she represented low-income immigrant crime victims. So thank you, Lisa, for being with us today as well. And finally, we have uh, Chuck Cuck, who is the managing partner of an Atlanta and Miami-based immigration law firm. He is the president-elect of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. He's also an adjunct professor of law at the University of Georgia, and he's practiced immigration law for more than 18 years and is a, an expert on business immigration law. So without further ado, I'm not going to take up the time to talk. I'm giving it to our participants. Um, first, we'll start off with Stuart. Thanks, Andy. I'll just uh, keep seated if that's all right. Um, the, um, I, I had a long career as uh, you know, a Washington lawyer doing a wide variety of regulatory programs before I came over to the department, uh, and I didn't come to do immigration work uh, that was sort of thrust upon me. Uh, 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 but I remember going to an early meeting with a bunch of agricultural employers, and one of them said, you have to understand uh, something about our business. Uh, we hire illegal workers, but we do it legally. And I thought, whoa, I'm not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> uh, but uh, that is, in fact, uh, uh, what a lot of employers think uh, the uh, immigration uh, employment system is. It's a set of rules that allow you to hire illegal workers and at the same time just say, well, you know, not my problem. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I think has characterized the department's approach to uh, uh, immigration is to say, you know, if this is going to be uh, a regulatory program, 
It ought to be run like a regulatory program. We shouldn't have fines that are uh, uh, laughable for the offenses. We ought to have actual enforcement. Uh, we ought to treat people who knowingly violate the rules as white-collar criminals and pursue them. Uh, and we ought to have mechanisms for making sure that the uh, uh, illegal work rules uh, actually can be applied in ways that uh, don't allow people to hire uh, illegal workers. Um, the um, that was part of our comprehensive immigration reform uh, program. It didn't pass. Everybody knows that. Uh, my theory about why it didn't pass is that nobody trusted uh, the people who woke up, paid attention for the period in which there was a debate, uh, didn't trust either party because they believed that both parties owed to their base uh, a kind of collusion in pretend enforcement of the immigration laws. Uh, uh, and so when we offered a, a bargain which we, in which we said, uh, um, if you will allow us to uh, uh, put in place all of these programs to legalize people, I, uh, we will enforce the laws, uh, uh, there was widespread skepticism that the f laws would actually be enforced after the uh, legalization was in place. Um, I can't say uh, that was completely misplaced skepticism. Um, we adopted a rule which was designed to uh, uh, wake, lo uh, wake businessmen up and ask them to do something and clarify what they should do in the event that they get a notice from the uh, Social Security Administration that says, uh, yo, you've got an employee whose name doesn't match his Social Security number. Uh, in fact, you got 20 or 1,000 or 4,000. Uh, <clears throat> employers have been getting those for a long time, and uh, they've many of them have simply ignored it, even though uh, a name that doesn't match the Social Security number is a pretty good indicator that there's some immigration fraud going on. Uh, we proposed a rule that simply said, this is what you should do if you get one of these notices. Uh, and we were sued by, well, immigrant rights groups. You'd expect that. The ACLU, you might expect that. Uh, the AFL CIO uh, and the Chamber of Commerce. So, you know, the Department of Homeland Security is bringing America together. Um, <laughs> This, but the, this, the coalition of folks who really don't want the laws enforced is pretty substantial. Uh, it, it wasn't enough to get comprehensive immigration reform passed, uh, though it may have been enough to kind of water down the enforcement to the point where people didn't believe it would happen. Um, it, that brings us to where we are today, which is uh, asking, well, what's going to happen over the next uh, uh, three, four years? Uh, I would be surprised, but not astonished, if immigration reform came back at the beginning of the next administration. It's, it's pretty obvious that you'd have to make an enormous commitment of presidential prestige to get that through. Uh, and probably you'd have to set it up so that both parties uh, were, uh, took some responsibility for passing it, or you would end up with a partisan battle of one sort or another. Um, I'm not sure we're going to have a situation where we have a president with enormous prestige to invest and enough divided government so that uh, both parties will take responsibility for comprehensive immigration reform. So I wouldn't be surprised if we ended up where we are now for a period of years. And where we are now is that uh, there's a whole batch of piecemeal proposals uh, pending. Uh, you know, wouldn't be surprised. You know, the AFL-CIO has what they want, and the uh, Chamber of Commerce has what they want, and the immigration groups uh, have what they want, and everybody would like to get their piece of immigration reform and hopefully leave the others behind if they can do it. Uh, I'm not sure whether that will work either. The, it's probably the case in this Congress that there's a, a substantial uh, a minority or, or maybe even a majority of uh, uh, Congress uh, opposed to one or all of those uh, individual group uh, agendas. Uh, uh, so 
we probably will not see major changes in the immigration law. Uh, right now, however, there's a, an effort going on to include the so-called ag jobs bill on uh, uh, the supplemental war appropriation, uh, uh, and, and that will be a real test of whether uh, <clears throat> a combination of business groups and immigrant rights groups can push something through uh, uh, despite the, uh, the bad experiences of last year. Uh, I'm guessing not. Uh, the ag jobs bill is uh, a remarkable throwback to 19 1986. It's probably closer to the 1986 uh, uh, law than anything that's been uh, proposed, including the comprehensive immigration reform from last year that we've seen. Uh, and I, I'm guessing that that will uh, provoke a lot of opposition to the uh, bill and that it will come off the supplemental. Uh, I certainly hope so. Um, Interestingly, there's not that much of a uh, uh, mandate uh, for enforcement. Uh, the uh, the people who want enforcement uh, uh, mostly are not well organized. The people, the the, the uh, uh, interest groups, are not as well organized as some of the uh, business or immigrant rights rights groups. Uh, they tend to rely on people who don't pay attention to this issue day in and day out. Um, what has emerged as a kind of lobby. For for enforcement, uh, ironically, is state legislators. Uh, <clears throat> State legislatures have begun to play a real role in the immigration debate as a result of statutes that uh, um, Arizona took the lead in uh, uh, passing, which require people in the state to use the electronic verification system uh, uh, or E-Verify. Uh, uh, this is something that we administer. It's a voluntary program, but the states have made it somewhat less voluntary from their point of view by requiring uh, their contractors or their uh, 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 license holders to use E-Verify. Um, that has uh, provoked, I think, a, a remarkable debate about the electronic verification system. I won't spend too long on that, but I did want to briefly uh, address a couple of issues because I think many of the people <coughs> – excuse me – uh, many of the interest groups that have been criticizing E-Verify are criticizing it not so much because it doesn't work, but because it actually does. It really does make it much more difficult to uh, legally hire illegal workers uh, because it checks at the outside, at the outset, to see whether the person's name matches their social security number. And if it doesn't, well, it gives them an opportunity to uh, uh, correct that. If they don't correct it, they can't keep the job. Uh, we have been making improvements in that program because we expected it to become mandatory if a comprehensive immigration reform passed. Uh, we've cut the uh, number of people who actually are mistakenly or, or, or who are required to go to the Social Security to correct their records uh, down from a fairly high number uh, to uh, less than one half of one percent uh, of the people who are entitled to the job uh, actually have to go to Social Security to get uh, uh, to correct records. Uh, and we think we'll cut that in half again in the next uh, month month or so with some uh, changes that we're making to the uh, uh, program. Uh, the result of that is that the program, which uh, the critics have said, well, only has about 60,000 or 65,000 uh, employers, is um, notwithstanding that number of employers, uh, actually accounting for one in eight or one in ten of all hires in the United States now go through the E-Verify system. That number is only going to grow as other states get on board with the kind of program that uh, uh, Arizona has adopted and as some of the high-tech companies that want to uh, get the benefit of some of our recent liberalizations join E-Verify. So we're going to see this, uh, this program begin to play a significant role in making it difficult for entire sectors of the economy to hire illegal workers. I'll be glad to talk about that more, but I think I've used up my 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Sue, for kicking off. Lisa? Um, thank you. Um, I'm quite honored to be here, and thank you all for sticking out the entire day. Um, I have to start with the caveat that my remarks are my own. They haven't been <coughs> reviewed or approved by uh, the subcommittee chairman, Senator Arakaka, or his staff, and they don't necessarily reflect his views, so um, keep that in mind. 
So as you all know, a little more than five years ago, the immigration functions of INS were transferred into the Department of Homeland Security. And in about a year, less than a year now, um, DHS will undergo its first presidential transition. So now is a good time to sort of look forward and look backward where we are and where we need to be. DHS brought together 22 component agencies that had been spread throughout the federal government with the core mission of protecting the U.S. against terrorist attacks. I should say that pulling together an organization of this size is a monumental challenge, um, and the department often is not given the credit that it deserves for the progress that's made on many fronts. I also want to emphasize that DHS employees do really hard work that's really important and often don't get the credit they deserve. Um, to be brief, I'm going to address just a couple of discrete issues, but feel free to ask me about topics I don't address. Um, so in the process of creating this new department, policymakers had to make judgment calls about what should be included and what shouldn't be included. I think at some point in time, we really need to step back and think carefully about what we really mean by homeland security and whether we have the right functions in the department, particularly with respect to certain immigration functions. But that's not going to happen right away, so we need to make sure that DHS functions as well as possible um, as it's composed. I'll start with one overarching concern that's come up a lot today. Um, we need comprehensive immigration reform, and we're not particularly close to getting there. No one is pleased with the large undocumented population, but removing 12 million people is impractical. It would cost billions and billions of dollars in addition to indirect economic harm to certain issues, to certain industries that rely heavily on immigrant labor, uh, which, by the way, include a lot of food-related industries, which are really struggling right now. It also would uproot millions of people, many of whom have been in the U.S. for years, many of whom, whom work hard, contribute to their communities, own homes, and have U.S. citizen children. Unfortunately, the political climate makes comprehensive reform very difficult. I think we would all do well to step back and refocus the debate on the root causes of unlawful immigration, some of which Stuart Baker was talking about. As long as U.S. employers continue to offer undocumented workers jobs, people will continue to come here. I personally have a hard time blaming people faced with the choice of having a hard time feeding their family wherever they're from and being able to do so in the United States for trying to come to the United States. I think a lot of people, if they were really honest with themselves, would reach the same conclusion. This brings me to my principal concerns from an oversight perspective. My chief concerns boil down to the tendency, particularly since immigration functions have moved to the Department of Homeland Security, to act as if undocumented workers generally are dangerous criminals. I think this is evident in DHS's increasingly aggressive immigration enforcement in recent years. Workplace enforcement actions, or raids, have expanded dramatically. Um, workplace arrests have risen tenfold in recent years, from approximately 500 in 2002 to about 5,000 in 2007. I still, despite some movement in uh, taking employers' actions a little more seriously, uh, mostly targets immigrants in these raids and in enforcement actions. Although workplace raids account for a small portion of um, immigration enforcement, I believe they illustrate a trend towards focusing res resources on arresting immigrants rather than um, targeting employers for their action. Um, take, for example, the recent ICE raids of the agroprocessors plant in Postville, Iowa. ICE rented out nearby fairgrounds um, to house detainees temporarily, and they raided the plant, arresting 389 immigrant workers. This was about 15% of the town's population. After the raid, about half of the students in the schools were absent because their parents were arrested or in hiding. Imagine what happens to a community, its businesses, its schools, the neighborhoods with vacant houses, its tax base, when you suddenly subtract such a large portion of the population. According to ICE, more than three-fourths of the company employees at that plant use false or suspect social security numbers. I would think under those circumstances, it would be possible to prove that company officials knew they were hiring illegal immigrants. Yet no company officials were arrested. ICE says they're under investigation, but ICE is also preparing to deport about 400 potential witnesses in the case. It seems like it would be more efficient and have better deterrent effects to focus on company actions rather than the workers it hired. ICE's conduct during raids also raises serious civil liberties concern. 
ICE agents locked down entire work sites, and, and this is according to Julie Meyer's testimony during her confirmation hearing, they question everyone inside about their immigration status. During this entire process, attorneys aren't allowed, much less media or outside observers, aren't allowed into the plant to observe or to help attorneys or immigrants. Um, ICE is also being increasingly aggressive in its actions after in ICE enforcement raids. Um, so instead of just removing these undocumented workers from the country, Recently, it's been criminally charging many of them with um, crimes including identity theft, theft of a social security number, and similar crimes. So in the raid I was just talking about, 306 of the 389 workers have been charged criminally with um, crimes like identity theft. The increased emphasis on immigration enforcement has spurred a growth in um, immigration detention, which also is troubling to me. ICE maintains our contracts for approximately 32,000 detention beds, up from about 19,000 in 2003. Um, and ICE has requested funding for an additional 1,000 beds in fiscal year 2009. We're spending a whole lot of money on this. ICE's fiscal year 2008 enacted budget was $5.6 billion. Um, and the administration's budget request is for $5.7 billion in FY09. The additional 1,000 beds alone will cost $46 million in FY09. Many of those detained don't really need to be. Although I believe that parole or alternatives to detention, such as electronic monitoring, should be used much more extensively, I'll focus on two discrete issues that I find particularly troubling. In May 2006, ICE opened the Hutto Family Detention Center in Taylor, Texas, which was converted from a medium security prison. ICE detains families with children as young as nursing infants in this facility. Due to pressure by outside advocates, ICE has scaled back use of this facility and has improved conditions considerably, uh, but it recently solicited uh, proposals for three new family detention centers. We need to fundamentally rethink our approach to family detention. Additionally, ICE routinely keeps asylum seekers in detention, a practice that can be truly traumatizing for someone fleeing persecution. Rates of parole vary widely across the country. Asylum seekers who pose no threat and, uh, and pose little flight risk should be paroled as soon as possible and using consistent standards. Recently, an ICE official commented that ICE isn't moving more toward alternative de alternatives to detention because most of these people are criminals and that would not be appropriate. In fact, few detainees have any sort of criminal record. Although I don't believe this comment reflects official ICE policy, it does betray a mindset that is all too common in ICE. With expanded detention, I believe we're more frequently failing in our um, obligation to ensure that every person in custody is treated with, in a humane and dignified manner. ICE detention standards have never been codified in law or regulation, so conditions may vary widely between facilities, and from time to time, pretty serious problems arise. The most troubling problem, as many of you know, has been in the news quite a bit lately. The Washington Post, 60 Minutes, and other organizations profiled some disturbing weaknesses in medical care provided to immigration detainees. Spending on health care has not increased enough to keep pace with the growth in the immigrant population and detention. The part, department at times is focused more on saving money than on providing appropriate care. Although I'm somewhat optimistic about improvements made in the past year or so, I believe greater oversight and accountability is needed. I focus mostly on ICE, but I'll comment briefly on CBP as well. CBP has made substantial progress in border security in the last few years, particularly along the southern border. However, as Senator, Senator Van de Pute suggested earlier, CBP needs to work more closely with communities to ensure that um, their perspectives are kept in mind in enforcement and border security and that disruption to communities is minimized as much as pos possible. Also, at times in the haste to make improvements in security, uh, there's been mismanagement and waste. For example, the Secure Border Initiatives Project 28, a project to build nine integrated camera radar towers along 28 miles of the border, was pushed forward too quickly without adequately defined contract terms and without enough oversight. As a result, problems with the project were not understood until very late in the process, and the system doesn't work as intended. CBP has already announced that it plans to replace the towers. 
Additionally, Secretary Chertoff's recent decision to waive 36 federal laws, including the National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Federal Water Pollution Act, and many others, um, in order to, fe to speed fence construction along the southern border raises very serious concerns. I would also note that we're expending tremendous amounts of money on border security. CBP's po CBP's total FY08 budget was nearly $9.3 billion, and the President has requested nearly $11 billion for FY09. We need to make sure that that money is being spent wisely. And that observation really goes for all of DHS's immigration-related spending. Much of the investment is necessary, but I believe that if we address the root causes of illegal immigration more directly and enacted comprehensive reform, we could get better results much more efficiently. We must restore great, greater balance and perspective to immigration administration and to the immigration debate generally. We have to remember always that immigrants, students and business visitors and foreign tourists make this nation more culturally and economically vibrant and we do ourselves tremendous long-term harm if we discourage them from coming. Uh, finally, let me say to those of you who are practitioners, immigrant rights advocates and others engaged in these issues, uh, that the system of checks and balances relies as much on oversight as legislation. So get to know congressional staffers and keep us up to date about problems in the system. We'll never be able to take up every issue and change won't happen as quickly or as completely as you might like, but oversight can be a very effective tool. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Both of you have given us a lot of food for thought, so I know there's going to be a, some good questions and answer session. Chuck, it's up to you. Thank you, Andy. Um, now for the rest of the story. Uh, for those of us who are on the front lines of, uh, of the Department of Homeland Security, I, I bring bad news. Things aren't getting any better. When Andy asked me to speak on this topic, I thought, well, this should be pretty easy. Department of Homeland Security five years later. All right, it's simple. Bad idea when they started with it, poorly executed, still a bad idea, and it doesn't seem to be getting any better. Any questions? All right, well, I've got a couple other issues I want to bring up, uh, if that's not enough for you. I think there are four key problems in the home, Department of Homeland Security that must immediately be fixed, uh, but I do not believe will be fixed until there's a change in administration. First, there is a complete and utter failure of policy coordination between the agencies that deal with immigration at Homeland Security. And I'll give you a couple examples. Between ICE, CBP, and uh, our folks over at CIS, together now apparently with TSA, uh, which I'll talk about here in a second, ask yourself this for those that practice, and I, I hope I don't throw out too much jargon for you. Uh, when you file for a green card in the United States, you file for adjustment of status. According to the CIS, you are in status. You're legally and lawfully present in the United States, even if you let your underlying visa status apply, uh, lapse. For ICE, you are out of status, and you're subject to being put into deportation proceedings, and they don't have to keep you here long enough to complete your adjustment of status. That's just stupid. That is the underlying basis of our immigration system, and the two main agencies that deal with it don't agree on it. CBP and ICE. When somebody comes into the United States, or CBP and CIS, when somebody comes into the United States, they're given an I-94 card, a little white card, delightful little thing, you carry it with you, prove you're in status. If there's a mistake made on that card, how do you get it fixed? Well, you go to CBP. What if you lose it? Well, you used to be able to file with CIS and get a replacement card, but not any longer. We don't do that anymore. That's CBP's job. Go to them. CBP says, we can't issue a replacement card. We'll give you this handy-dandy piece of computer printout. Just carry that with you. I'm sure the police officer who stops you for driving will understand. Uh, this is a crazy thing. We need to have serious policy coordination between these agencies. Next, poor morale. Met a happy DHS person recently? <laughs> so I'll have Stewart. I'm uh, right now in the midst of, uh, of the inside part of a worksite enforcement action, working uh, jointly with some ICE officers who are longtime friends of mine. They hate their jobs. They see that what they're accomplishing is meaningless to them. How meaningful is it to arrest yet another person trying to provide food for his family's table without significantly and seriously going after the employers or the individuals who provide the documents or the process by which these folks obtain their employment authorization. 
It makes no sense. They're simply very unhappy people. And I'm a business owner. I feel that work for me. If I have an unhappy employee, I don't look at them. I look at me. This is a management issue. This agency has incredibly poor management from top to bottom. They're not doing what's necessary to make their employees happy, to make the workplaces places people want to go. If protecting America is the key point of this agency's existence, and so these people's job is to protect America, why are they so unhappy? Isn't there no greater thing than protecting the United States? I don't think there is. I think what they can do and what their option and possibilities of doing are incredible to help America. But that's not what they're doing. And they are unhappy because of it. Next, security. Why do we have our immigration process in the Department of Homeland Security? This is not where you process people who are the future of the United States. You treat every single immigration issue as a security problem. I go every day to interviews. I go every day to immigration court. I go every day to detention centers. They're treated like they're terrorists, which is absolutely an outrageous way to treat people. Example, you come into the airport. How many times have you read articles from European newspapers about the mistreatment of their citizens entering the United States by CBP? They feel like, and they always say this, I was treated like a terrorist when I got there. Isn't there a better way to treat people coming to America to spend their money? I read an article yesterday about a young a woman who processed for her husband's green card. She talked about the humiliation of going through the process of lost files, of lost process, of being poorly treated by the individuals, and being felt like, to made, like she was a terrorist. We cannot have people who are the customers of, this age, of these agencies feeling this way. These are, after all, service agencies. They're not meant or designed to root out terrorism. And it's a great concern for the people that work there. We can talk, for example, about E-Verify, a ridiculous system. I'm sorry, Stuart, it is a ridiculous system. I'll tell you why it's a ridiculous system. I think, in theory, it can work. It can. And it's called the National ID Card. And it has your picture and your Social Security number and your fingerprint. But Americans are never going to allow a national identification card. So we're stuck with this system, which has your name and your number in it. So when Bob Jones comes to my company, and I run them through E-Verify, and sure enough, that's Bob Jones. He can go to work. What happens when he's not really Bob Jones? I mean, that is the great fault in the E-Verify system. Recently, the reason I'm working with ICE on this big thing that we're working on, the company has 1,000 employees. person comes in and says, I want to work for your company. We run them through E-Verify. doesn't work. He says, sorry, you don't qualify. You're not in, you're not in here. It's not you. And she says, I know I should have bought my documents from that person across the hallway. And they end up having 50% of their workforce all cleared E-Verify, and they're illegal. That is the great fault of the verification program. It doesn't work. It can never work until the system, it's not, more, it's not about, hey, the numbers are wrong, or I didn't update my name. It's about identity theft and the false sense of security that E-Verify creates for employers. What is this employer to do when they lose 50% of their employees in the next two months? Just tell the people they supply product to, sorry, you'll have to wait a couple more weeks to get fed. It's a ridiculous system. We have to come up with a better way that actually works. Forcing employers to enroll in E-Verify, promising them benefits like extensions on their OPT, but only if they enroll in E-Verify is blackmail. Much the same as premium processing at the CIS, which is nothing more than extortion for them not doing their job fast enough with the normal outrageous processing fees that they have. I'm sorry, I'm really ticked off. <laughs> and finally... We can tell, Chuck. I know. It's not personal, Stuart, I promise you. Um, finally, uh, we are creating a culture of fear in America. We're creating, creating a culture of hate. We're creating a culture of no through each of these agencies and through Homeland Security. We are intending through these raids to scare people into leaving. Now I know part of it's probably designed to try to show America that we're actually enforcing the law. Big deal. We arrested 5,000 people that were working illegally last year. Let's have a party. There are 12 million people working without status, supposedly. There's 170 million people in the workforce. What good is it going after 5,000 
people trying to put food on their families' tables? How many employers were indicted? How many went to federal prison? Where is the newspaper reporters accompanied by ICE when they go and instead of hauling off the workers, they haul off the HR department? You haul off a couple of HR departments, you will get some serious compliance with this program. But they're afraid to do that, and that is the great bugaboo about this system. It's not helping America move forward. It's simply creating more fear and more mistrust of government. When Homeland Security does its job, when it gets rid of that issue, the culture of fear, when it, instead of focusing on security, focuses on service and compliance, when it increases the morale of its workers, when it deals with substantial policy coordination in its agencies, then it will be a successful department. For now, it is nothing more than a miserable failure waiting to be helped. And I hope whatever change in administration occurs, that help will happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chuck. Now, I think the most extraordinary thing is that each of our speakers actually listened to me when I said, please limit your remarks to 10 minutes, which gives us a good deal of time to have questions and answers. So thank you for listening to me. I'd like people who are interested in asking questions to, to come forward or identify themselves by hand so that our people with the, um, very good, we have somebody up front, uh, those with the speakers can give it to them. But what I'd like to do before we start is just give anybody on the panel who would like to say anything in response to remarks that they've heard this, morning, this afternoon an opportunity to Mr. Jill, has her respond got something before we get into the Q&A. I think it's only fair to do that. Anybody who would? I'll take that. Stuart, <laughs> Stuart please go right ahead. I, I, I will not say that the principal reason that uh, AILA resents uh, pre pre premium processing fees is that uh, it cuts into the other extorter from uh, the immigrants, uh, the people who are charging them their own fees. Uh, I'm not going to uh, – that's a cheap shot. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but Coming from a lawyer, yeah, Stuart, yeah. really. <laughs> Recovering lawyer, I'll have you know. <laughs> I, but I actually I did want to uh, uh, thank Lisa uh, for uh, saying nice things about uh, the department's employees because they do work extraordinarily hard. Do. Uh, uh, DHS employees encounter more Americans when Americans don't want to encounter anybody from the government than anybody else uh, in the federal uh, uh, government. Uh, uh, from uh, the airports uh, when you're getting on a domestic flight to arriving here jet lagged uh, uh, and dealing with customs, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's not, we're not at our best when we deal with DHS employees and they uh, uh, usually handle that uh, with remarkable uh, uh, fortitude. Uh, and I appreciate your uh, 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 saying that. Uh, the other, uh, I want to uh, start with, I think, what we had in common. Uh, what I thought was remarkable is that uh, both uh, Lisa and Chuck said, uh, how come you're not arresting more uh, HR uh, uh, employees? Uh, how come the employers are not suffering uh, uh, as a, in these raids? Now, in most cases, that's an exaggeration. We uh, have in, uh, launched investigations of HR employees who are complicit in uh, uh, violations, who sell uh, 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 ID cards or who uh, assist in people to get uh, uh, Social Security numbers that will pass E-Verify or something of this sort. Uh, and we have uh, uh, prosecuted union officials as well as uh, uh, HR employees for that, and we will continue to investigate that and treat that very seriously. Uh, the real problem uh, with holding employers to account is that uh, the law really does not allow employers to be held to account uh, in most cases, unless they basically start conniving at uh, the creation of false documents and information, all they have to do is what the, that uh, fellow who introduced immigration law to me said, just hire illegal uh, workers legally. All you have to do is check a document and say, that document checks off. Uh, uh, you can ignore, it appears, uh, at least until our uh, no match uh, reg uh, provides some standards. You can ignore uh, lots of evidence that your workers are not legal. Uh, and uh, uh, the statutes do not 
plainly and clearly state that that's something that you shouldn't do. Uh, and so the question of why our employers not uh, uh, punished more often is because the laws we have don't really authorize that. Uh, uh, we think that should be changed. Uh, uh, and we think, actually, that E-Verify is the beginning of that. Uh, uh, Chuck spent a lot of time saying, oh, well, it doesn't work. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, it, it can be defeated with identity theft. Uh, there are millions of people working today with a Social Security number that does not match their name. Those people are overwhelmingly uh, illegal immigrants. Uh, uh, and if we had E-Verify, they would not be able to continue to work in that fashion. Now, could they steal an identity, use the name of somebody who actually is authorized to work? Uh, um, yes and no. Uh, uh, Chuck, uh, I think, dramatically over-exaggerated uh, uh, the extent to which uh, uh, we need a, a national ID card to make uh, E-Verify work. We have already begun uh, uh, taking steps to make uh, identity theft uh, un an unsuccessful strategy for uh, defeating E-Verify. For example, if someone uh, hires a, a worker who walks in with a DHS um, issued ID, which is pretty much everybody who has a legal job but uh, who's an immigrant. Uh, um, it's a, a green card that we've issued or some other form of uh, uh, ID. There'll be a picture on it. Uh, if they show that card to their employer, we can display to the employer the picture that ought to be on that card. Not just a, another picture of the same person, the very same picture. If it doesn't have the same t-shirt, if it doesn't have the pen in the pocket, if it doesn't have the hair parted in the right place, uh, just the way it is on the picture that's supposed to be on that card, they can be sure that that person's engaged in identity theft. Uh, we are working with the passport, uh, with the State Department, so that soon passports, passport cards, and a variety of visas will also be subject to uh, uh, display of photos to make it difficult to steal IDs uh, using those uh, documents. Uh, and let's remember that it, uh, stealing 12 million identities is going to be extraordinarily difficult. By and large, people steal one identity and they share it around. And that means you can catch people because you'll start to see folks showing up in place after place after place and you can say this has all the hallmarks of identity theft. Uh, so there are a variety of ways in which we can continue to improve this program to make identity theft a less successful strategy for uh, uh, addressing uh, uh, the uh, uh, the program, uh, and last, uh, let me just say uh, the notion that uh, immigration has nothing to do with security is is the kind of statement that could only be made by somebody who slept through September 11th. Uh, the people who attacked us on September 11th were here because they went through immigration. They went through a visa process. They overstayed their visas in many cases, uh, uh, and they were uh, um, subject to deportation in many cases if we had identified them, caught them. Since uh, September 11, we have deported a number of people who are serious security threats because they were not in status. Uh, that is a much faster route than uh, going through the process of uh, uh, a criminal prosecution uh, and after which you have the folks in the United States. Uh, so uh, uh, from improving our visa process to improving the investigations we do of people who want to have lawful status uh, to the deportation of people who represent security threats, immigration law has turned out to be an enormously valuable tool in protecting our security. And to suggest that it has nothing to do with uh, uh, security, I think, uh, misses the point. Thanks. Thank you, Stuart. And I think we will now open it up to, to questions from our audience. We have somebody right up here at front. And please raise your hand so other people with microphones can come up to you. Please introduce yourself, identify yourself, and then ask your question. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Francisco Villagran. I'm with the Embassy of Guatemala. And I have a question about the, uh, uh, the issue of identity theft. I understand that uh, identity theft is meant to defraud, to defraud the individual whose identity has been stolen, to clean his bank account to use his credit cards. This is not what illegal immigrants are doing. It is true that uh, they are using false social security numbers. And it is true that that is against the law. But I'm not sure that it, it is equal to identity theft. I'm not sure. I don't know 
Uh, I know that uh, more than 200 Guatemalans were detained in Iowa last week, and they were charged with identity theft. Now, they want to be deported. Our consular authorities went to see them, and all they're asking is to be deported as soon as possible. Instead, they're being charged with identity theft. So who knows how long they are going to be investigated, whether they are going to be charged, whether they are going to be jailed. Uh, so I wonder, what is the merit of this argument or this case of identity theft? Thank you. I'll, I'll be glad to take that. Uh, I, I think you would not ask that question if you had had, as I have had, uh, letters from people whose identities have been stolen. Uh, uh, when they talk about the extraordinary difficulty that they have recovering uh, their uh, uh, good name, their credit, uh, and uh, uh, making sure that it doesn't happen again. Uh, it is not the case that um, it is somehow a victimless crime to uh, take someone else's Social Security number and name and work on that. Uh, uh, in many cases, the people who use those names and Social Security numbers to get work also use them to uh, uh, get credit uh, and to uh, uh, build a, a, a credit record, uh, which often is not as good as the persons they've stolen. Uh, it, it becomes an enormous com co enormously complex task for uh, the, the person whose identity has been stolen, even if it's by someone who means them no harm, uh, uh, to recover their credit. Uh, it is a crime, and it's, it has real victims. There are millions of people whose identities are stolen every year in this country. Uh, and. Uh, 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 Solving the problem can take years uh, as people move from place to place, hand off the identity to a second or a third or a fourth illegal worker until uh, it really seems impossible for someone to recover their single identity and their credit. Thank you, Stuart. We have a hand back there and two, three hands, I see. Go right ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, employers around the country have um, been employing undocumented. Could you just introduce yourself oh, again? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just for our panelists, at least. Um, my name is Katie Simpson. I just graduated from law school at the University of Baltimore, and I'm with the Maryland Immigrant Rights Coalition. Thank you. Across the country, employers are employing undocumented people instead of employing U.S. citizens. And they are able to justify this risk to themselves by paying undocumented people significantly lower wages, starvation wages, and they are pocketing that money. So what is the problem with making employers who are violating the laws pay back this money that they are unjustly keeping? We proposed uh, multiplying the fines for violations of the uh, uh, immigration uh, work provisions by 10 times. So uh, we're with you in terms of uh, making it uh, a much more dangerous thing to do to uh, engage in, in violations as an employer. I haven't thought about the question of uh, whether we could get, uh, uh, you know, uh, force a kind of recoupment of uh, uh, the difference between the Price, the wages they ought to have paid and the wages they did pay, and that might be a tricky thing to find, uh, to measure if they paid more than the, f the minimum wage. Uh, um, but there have been, uh, in fact, some RICO cases that have been brought by private parties in order to, rec the, uh, to claim a pattern or practice of violation by uh, uh, employers. Uh, um, and uh, at least some of those cases have survived motions to dismiss. I'm not sure that they've ever gone to judgment. That does raise in, in my mo my own mind, though, the um, given what you were saying earlier, Stuart, about the the weakness in the employer sanctions law currently, about actually working together with the Department of Labor or even state labor uh, departments to uh, implement the labor laws. Um, is there is there serious effort at DHS? I haven't heard of this, but there may be serious efforts to coordinate and work together with. 
the Labor Department on those issues? We've, we've worked with the Labor Department on a lot of things. We have a very good relationship with them, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I could point to a, a, a coordinated investigation. We do occasionally find labor violations when we do these investigations, and uh, I, uh, we're happy to report them because uh, uh, some of these are really are exploitive uh, work sites. Uh, um, uh, but uh, uh, apart from our efforts to make sure that there isn't discrimination in the workforce when people are applying our uh, immigration law, uh, uh, em employment law provisions. Uh, I couldn't point you to uh, a uh, coordinated enforcement mechanism. Okay, thank you. We have a, a couple of hands back here, and then Don Kerwin up here, right in the back, sitting down. Please stand. And so I rise, tired in the afternoon. Uh, Tom Brenneman with the 3D Security Initiative of Eastern Mennonite University. Okay, Vidas, five years hence, DHS. Um, will the semantics or praxis of DHS in terms of homeland security have a more expansive notion and practice of dealing with the question, not so much of nuances and processes and practices of detention, enforcement, and the like, but dealing with the fundamental question of why people are migrating. Uh, internal conversations between DHS and state and other entities to help to stabilize migrant producing communities to kind of take some of these security dimensions off the table and in, in essence begin to parse what are economic concerns in terms of immigration and fundamental issues of real security, counter-terror, etc. Will we have a better security frame five years hence? where real security, human security, uh, may actually be a lived reality. Okay, Vidas, where are we going? You want to take that one? Or should I? You can go ahead and now. Okay. <laughs> um, a couple of thoughts. I mean, uh, the root causes of immigration, I, I think that everybody's uh, natural assumption is that people uh, immigrate, they leave their the country they are comfortable in that is their home and move to a, a completely different uh, uh, place to earn a living uh, because they can earn a better living uh, uh, by migrating and uh, legally or illegally they, they are drawn by the opportunity to er earn more uh, money. Uh, that's certainly how uh, most of us have seen the current illegal immigration problem in the United States uh, and, and uh, Europe has a very substantial illegal immigration problem as well. Um, if if we have to cure world poverty to stop illegal immigration, we've defined a pretty substantial task for ourselves. Uh, um, you know, the uh, Mexican economy has at least come close to matching uh, the U.S. over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and we have begun to see the emergence of not just a Mexican illegal immigration problem on the southwest border, but a completely international Im uh, illegal immigration problem. Uh, um, briefly, 20% of the illegal immigrants we were picking up on the southwest border were non-Mexicans uh, who had come from other poorer countries than Mexico to try their luck. Uh, um, North Africa is full of uh, sub-Saharan Africans who are waiting for boats to try to get into uh, 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 Europe. Uh, so uh, it's a very tough problem to solve uh, just by uh, development in one country. Uh, and uh, as an example of some of the other things that you have to do, I think uh, um, one of the reasons that we had so many non-Mexicans coming across the border is because we didn't have enough beds at the time, uh, hence the investment in beds, uh, uh, and people were being let go and told to show up in three months uh, uh, for their hearing. And not surprisingly, they said, okay, and where's the bus to Chicago? Uh, so uh, uh, they didn't show up. Uh, we began in, in the last two years uh, to detain those folks and send them right home. Uh, and so uh, now when we catch someone who's not a Mexican at the uh, uh, Mexican border, uh, within 30 days, 90% or more are back in their home country. And uh, the percentage of um, uh, immigrants crossing the border, uh, illegal immigrants crossing the border who are non-Mexicans has been cut in half or more. Uh, that's deterrence. So it's clear 
clear that uh, having the beds to deter people, to, to detain people, and to be able to send them back quickly has a substantial deterrent effect on uh, illegal immigration. You have to do a balanced response to all of these things. We obviously haven't done a good job uh, in il eliminating illegal jobs, uh, but we are doing a better job of um, using our capabilities at the border to deter at least non-Mexican uh, illegal immigration. Um, I'll just add briefly, of course, immigration is extremely complex and multifaceted, and I think we haven't been doing a good enough job at really looking at all of the sort of economic and cultural di dimensions in addition to the security dimensions in recent years, which, you know, is understandable, of course, after 9-11, but I think we really need to get back into some of the nuances. Um, while, of course, we can't solve world poverty um, and people will always try to migrate, certainly sort of thinking about the economic magnet here and also economic development in other, con in other countries can help. Um, for example, NAFTA had very bad effects on, on agriculture in Mexico, and that actually spurred a lot of immigration. So you had people whose farms were failing in southern Mexico migrating to work at U.S. farms um, here illegally. So, you know, we need to, we can't solve all the problems, but we need to sort of look at all the dimensions as we think about how to address this complicated, multifaceted problem. I think one way to, to reduce that future flow of, of folks coming illegally to the United States is to have a legal immigration system that actually works. Uh, when you only let 140,000 people immigrate for jobs every year in, in an economy of 170 million jobs, you clearly don't have a big enough system that, that worked for you. If you had a legal immigration system where employers could actually get temporary workers to work in the fields or in the factories for X period of time, uh, and there were job, there were a process that worked for them, then it would be much easier to go after those employers who don't follow that system. Right now, there simply is no real alternative for many employers to find those people. So I think the, the solution doesn't necessarily rely exclusively on DHS here. Uh, Congress needs to fix this problem. And I think if Congress could step in and create a legal immigration system that works, DHS's job becomes much easier and much easier to go after the bad actors in this process. Thank you. Uh, Don, next, and then we'll go to the back, I promise. Yeah, I, I had a question for Stuart, actually. I used to, um, I used to attend the very excellent... Um, ABA national security breakfast that you ran, and, and, and I'm actually confused by this, that um, what DHS is doing now is it's prosecuting people for document fraud who were working, you know, and sometimes those documents are voluntarily given by people, but they're prosecuting them and then deporting them, but for people that represent national security risks, they're not prosecuting them, but they're deporting them where they're still out there kind of presenting a risk to the U.S. I mean, that would seem to me inconsistent with what a lot of the security experts have said over and over again. Yeah, I, I don't think that we are um, deporting people that we are uh, sure we would be better off prosecuting. That, that That's not rational, and uh, therefore I think you're wrong to assume that that's what's going on. Uh, uh, and to suggest that we are uh, um, prosecuting people that, that uh, have been voluntarily given uh, uh, the, what, uh, allowed to borrow an identity as opposed to stealing it, uh, or actually suggest that maybe the person who loaned it also ought to be prosecuted uh, um, because they're part of the fraud. They obviously know why they're providing this it's so that they can engage in the illegal work. I actually was picking up on what you said. You said you were deporting people who are national security risks. We are. But you can't prosecute them. Why? I, uh, for uh, Well, I, let's suppose that uh, the reason we know that they're a security threat is uh, because we have classified uh, sources and methods that have compromised them. And would uh, they still be a risk when you after you deport them to U.S. interests? To you? Yes, obviously. It would be better if we could lock them up for life, uh, but you can't always do that. Uh, if we deport them, we'll have their fingerprints, we have their uh, uh, statistics, we can warn the governments that, that we're deporting them to to watch them, uh, uh, and uh, we've had a reasonably good, we've had reasonably good luck keeping them out of the United States after we've identified them. 
we know we now have a system that says that you have to have your fingerprints scanned in order to come into the United States if you're not a U.S. citizen. Very difficult, therefore, for somebody whose fingerprints we have on file as a security risk to get into the country. Or anybody else. <laughs> Just pointing out the obvious. Yes, we have an outcome right to you next. We had a gentleman who's been patient over here. I just had a question for... Please um, introduce yourself sir, again. Yeah, yeah, my name you. is Altaf Hussein from Howard University. I uh, write and speak on the, issue, on the area of Muslim integration, and then I actually have the double honor of living it as I'm writing about it. So the question to Mr. Baker, and I really appreciate uh, Charles Cox's uh, presentation is that what is the recourse? I mean, I'm a citizen, for example, and there are Muslim Americans who are citizens of the, of the United States, but there's a challenge of coordination, whereby on the one hand, you are, uh, the, the agency treats you as a citizen, so you come and you show your documents, but on the other hand, there's almost like this suspicion that is consistent and constant. And the, from a social work perspective, the mental health impact on the individual's and therefore their families, is so great that I can't imagine that we have not yet come up with a system that says, we know you may have the name that suits someone else's name, but we can ensure that you live in Falls Church, Virginia, at such and such address and whatever. So the irony is, on the one hand, for example, uh, uh, the Dutch government had a major problem with integration, and this new movie was coming out with from a right-wing film, um, a right-wing politician. They actually went to Homeland Security and said, we need to talk to some Muslims in America who can help us with this problem. The Dutch come to talk to me, among other leaders. I help them. I'm actually flying there in June. I just came back from there. I'm helping them. When I go to Europe, no one questions me. I show the passport, I walk in. Come back to Newark, come back to Dulles. The same treatment, consistently. Copying of every document, copying of my thesis for my dissertation. I mean, it, it makes no sense. That there's this irony that on the one hand, the same government would say, yeah, talk to these people, they're you know, it's, uh, apparently integrating very well, and they speak highly of their life in the U.S. The Dutch think I work for the American government. They think I'm a, I paint a rosy picture, can you really do this, do you really, I mean, maybe you unzip your beard when you go back into America, you know, what do you do? Right? And I'm telling them that it's working, my, but I can't have my son, six-year-old son, this last in, uh, uh, experience into Canada, I wrote to TRIP, the Tribal Redress Program, they wrote back. After a year, after speaking to Chief Aguilar at a public meeting, suddenly a letter appeared in my mailbox. I had never received a response. Dated November, received in February. Somehow I got it. It said, we can't confirm or deny that you have some information about you that triggers these things. And we can't confirm or deny that if it should exist, it's been corrected. Do you know what happened the next time I went to Canada? Eight guards, not less than eight guards, surrounded my car. Positive ID, positive ID. Security room, get him in a secure room, my family. I mean, it's ridiculous. It makes no sense that the people who are trying to make American, uh, um, I mean, be ambassadors for America overseas are then treated as terrorist or suspicious uh, characters upon re-entry. So what is, where, what is the recourse, not only for its citizens, but also for those who are permanent you know, uh, uh, residents who may be just going about their basic life and not being cast with such, a, you know, such a, a suspicions? Yeah, I, I, I have occasionally heard stories like this, and, and they're very troubling. I, I, uh, there are certain circumstances where uh, you know, we do have information that uh, requires us to uh, uh, carry out investigations that we can't talk about, but I I, I think it is also the case that uh, we get uh, uh, cases of mistaken identity or uh, uh, overreaction. Uh, it does sound to me as though you have done what you ought to do, and uh, I will, I'll be glad to, if you'll talk to me afterwards, I'll check and see what, uh, uh, whether there's something more that needs to be done. Um, the Terrorist Screening Center's watch list has nearly 800,000 names on it, so that's part of the problem, and then you add to it the problem with... Uh, similar names and identical names. So so no one wants to be the person who misses the terrorist, which is understandable, but we need to fix the process of the traveler redress program, the sort of vetting of how names get on the terrorist screening centers list and how names come off the terrorist screening centers list because there's dramatic over-inclusion on the list. Um, I think this happens all the time. Uh, I hear from people once a week that the same thing has happened to them. I don't think it's rare at all. Uh, I think you need to sue the, go the government. 
Uh, no, I think you go to federal court on issues like this where you're completely, you're consistently harassed, you've done everything you legally can do. At a certain point, you have to involve the judicial branch to force Homeland Security to fix this problem. Uh, and I, I think if it doesn't get fixed, it's what you should do. I'm a big fan of suing the government. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we should have a surgeon on here. He'd recommend surgery. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting to that discussion, but slowly, Stuart. Let's not rush. Yes, please. Thanks, yeah. you know, um, my name is Margot Gatzman. I do represent a consulting company, and we are do plan to organize a conference about migration policies and development of this country. So let me uh, raise a few important concerns about this misunderstanding, this, uh, the problem with the mixing problems. I mean, the problem of security is a different problem from the problem of the positive policy, how to encourage people to be here to co-create with us our economic progress. And you know, to the, to this year, UN system organizes a conference in Philippines about migration and development international societies decided to once again look at the problem of migration from a different point of view. Not only from the point of view of the security issues and the problem of the defensive policies, but also from the point of view of the potential progress that people, new guys who are coming to new country might create. So they will, uh, they will discuss the problem how to secure uh, internationally, how to secure from the legal point of view people who try to move from one country to another one to get new job. Not because of that, that they, they are casualties of any kind of uh, political problems in their own country, but because they are, they are trying to get new job and create good things for the new country. That's their right. So they will try to uh, look at that problem from this perspective, and we will also do, try to do that uh, speaking about economic development of this country, many authors recently uh, uh, wrote books about uh, scientific proofs that people, new people, immigrants in, in, country, in Western countries that do play important role of the real economic progress of these countries. So that's not true. That's a kind of stereotype that we are still... Uh, treating them as, as people who may steal our jobs, destroy our societies, and be a potential threat to our countries. So this new approach and the new tendency, it's not just illusion and a fantasy of a, you know, human rights representatives, but this is a, a findings after many, many research done and this is now quite obvious that we should look at this problem also from this point of view. So there is no guilt. There is no, you know, um, in my opinion, uh, we try to address all these issues discussing with our authorities, I mean, with people responsible for security, that they don't understand this developmental aspect of the issue. This is not their job to see the developmental aspects of the issue. They are they trying do their own job, which is quite obvious that they try to secure us and our country, but uh, they do not uh, a, take responsibility, that's also obvious and clear, uh, in this matter of development. This is not their job. So I do propose to think about the role of immigration policy in the future from the perspective of development, which is a separate issue, and from the point of view of security, as is a, a kind of different point. And if you mix these two kinds of thinking, we will have all these problems when solving uh, these uh, problems of immigrants in our country. Uh, it's impossible to, to do that uh, having only one institution responsible for security also issues, only issues. So that's my proposal. So that, uh, I do see the same, the same problems. I mean, immigrants are complaining all the time, and they are you know, right to do that. Uh, my businessmen, they are complaining all the time. They have a lot of you know, um, uh, real issues to be solved. And still do you have a the question? Country, yeah, the question, the question is, uh, if there is any 
uh, suggestion coming from such institutions like Homeland Security or such institutions like um, human rights representatives, uh, what, what kind of role they might play in this new pro-developmental policy? That's my question. Thank you. I think that's for you, Chad. <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. I appreciate that. <laughs> yes. All right, let me take it in a, a final question in a different, different direction uh, for the moment. And that is this. It was actually raised earlier, uh, and I think this is what we'll end on. Um, Lisa raised it and said it would be difficult to get to. But I think, you know, this is the question that was asked when DHS was created. Can DHS handle two very, very different missions, that is, enforcement and services? So let's end this briefly, perhaps, with a comment from each of our panelists on whether they think that is Given the, the, the five years and looking forward, what's your advice to the next administration? Can DHS handle this, these two missions um, as a single agency? Is that the best governmental approach? And we can start anywhere, whoever wants to begin. I'll go first. This way Stuart gets the last word. Um, I think it can, frankly. I think Homeland Security can handle both of these. Uh, I think it requires a, a modicum of, of decent management. Uh, I think it requires that there be coordination between people that understand the issues. Uh, I think it's going to be required that the next administration uh, have people who are deeply concerned and understand both the security side of immigration and the server side of immigration working hand in hand, uh, and that they're, uh, the senior level people within Homeland Security that are responsible for overseeing the structures of both I and CBP and INS actually be one coordinating person, uh, which is, as I understand the current structure, is not right now. Uh, and, and as that report is done, kind of a super commissioner of the old INS, as that coordination is done, I do believe we can improve both the service provided by the folks at CBP and CIS and the security and enforcement that's required by the folks at CBP and ICE. Thank you, Chuck. Lisa? Um. I've struggled quite a bit with this question, um, particularly with respect to CIS. Um, I think I tend towards saying CBP should be in DHS. Part of the difficulty is many, many, many federal government programs have a security-related aspect, uh, including programs that are in DOJ, in the intelligence community, and other parts of the government. So it's sort of a question of what where's the right place for it, given that many programs will have uh, non-security related aspects that are perhaps very dominant in their mission, but that security is a reality that they have to deal with. Um, so whether they should be, they are, and they're probably not going anywhere. So we need to make them work better. <coughs> Thank you. Stuart? So I think we have unanimity on this one. Uh, um, I haven't gotten to speak yet. Nope. <laughs> uh, 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 well, I'm going to be closing. Uh, the, uh, uh, one of the clear rules about Washington that I've learned over the last three years is if you're responsible some, for something, you ought to be responsible for it. That way you can fire the person who's responsible. Uh, and if you divide up the responsibility, everybody says, well, it was really somebody else's fault. Uh, uh, all of those, uh, if, if you read the Washington Post reports about health services in, uh, uh, at ICE, uh, you'd be forgiven if you didn't notice that the uh, uh, health service was until very recently, you know, within the last year, run by a different agency uh, and only recently transferred to ICE so that uh, um, uh, they've only begun to be able to take responsibility for the health services that they provide to the people they detain. They should, and they should take responsibility for uh, the errors as well as the uh, uh, successes. Uh, but to divide it up means that everybody else is saying, well, somebody else didn't do their job. Uh, and as for uh, combining security and services, uh, we, we can't forget that one of the things that ensured that uh, the uh, uh, services part of uh, uh, the old INS would be transferred and, and assigned security responsibilities was the issuance of a uh, uh, student visa renewal to Mohammed Atta six months after uh, uh, he uh, flew a plane into a building here. Uh, there, you cannot uh, separate the security and the services part of uh, the immigration business, I don't think, or at least not safely. Thank you very I, much. Go ahead, I would, It's the FBI that actually does the background checks, so I'm not sure that that's really 
Oh, no, I, and we, we do a lot of security, uh, a lot of the security work. Uh, it is true that there is a background check that is done by uh, uh, the FBI, but uh, uh, we have automated a number of our records and integrated them into the inquiries that uh, uh, the uh, uh, CIS performs. I would note that they didn't approve the Muhammad Adas visa, that they just mailed it out what was previously in the backlog of mailing. So I'm not going to blame them all at INS for making that mistake on September 4th and, and, 11. Right. and I'm not going to assert he had a lawyer. So. No, no, he didn't. First, let me thank everybody in the audience for, for participating in the conference today. There is one session after here, or there may be more breakout sessions. I'll let somebody announce that. But before we leave, please join me in thanking our panelists for an excellent set of discussions on these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Okay, if I could just have your attention for one more minute, I'm going to make an announcement about the breakout sessions. Um, we had a number of suggestions for breakout sessions, and we've set up five classrooms for you to use. In room 109, there's a session on educating immigrants about the law. In room 110, there's a discussion on visa policy and its effects on immigrant families and workers. In room 140, there's a discussion on customer and stakeholder issues and USCIS policy for refugees and asylees. Room 149 is how faith-based communities can work with new, the new priorities addressed by Frank Sherry. And in Room 164, it's medical and naturalization disability waivers issues. Right. Thank you.